the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory see the price of our redemption Good evening. It is uh, my privilege to begin our corporate worship tonight by reading scripture. So please take your Bibles and turn to Revelation 10. Revelation 10 begins by the detailing of a glorious angel who is standing on land and sea and has an open scroll of judgment in his hand. After the angel cries out with a loud voice, a procession of seven peals of thunder begins, which communicate discoveries um, that the apostle at that time was not yet allowed to write. In verses 5 through 7, we see a solemn oath taken by this angel to God Almighty. In verses 8 through 11, uh, we see a strict charge given to John and then directed to take the scroll from the angel and to eat it. This echoes a similar call to Ezekiel in chapter uh, 2 and 3 of Ezekiel, where the prophet ate a scroll of judgment before proclaiming its contents. The scroll uh, scroll that John eats is sweet to the taste, but bitter to the stomach. For John to receive the words of God is a privilege, even if it means, even if those words announce a bitter judgment to the world. So please stand as I follow, please stand and follow as I read Revelation 10. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, 
clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And then he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, and there will be a delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, and he preached to his servants and the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me, and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel, who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, and telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will, be, it will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey, and when I had, when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And then he said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Pray with me. Father, as we read this part of scripture, we are reminded that history will proceed just as you have ordained it and will occur according to your sovereign will. Rebellious hearts, neutral attitudes, and the self-righteous will all face the perfect judge and give an account for their thoughts and actions. We confess that each and every one of us will face your, would face your bitter wrath if it wasn't for your son, Jesus Christ. Because of him, we are not only forgiven, but also purified from the stains of sin. We thank you for giving us eyes of faith to see the realities that your, world, your word reveals, for enabling us to repent of our sin and for giving us a new heart to believe your promises. We pray for the men who are preaching tonight as they have taken your word, wrestled with the truths contained in it, and are now ready to proclaim it. May your word be consumed like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us exalt Christ together, singing the glories of our God in the triumphs of his grace.
his obedience and his humility to take on flesh. Lord, to live as one of his creation. Lord, yet we thank you that he was not like us. He lived a sinless life. Lord, and thus was a sufficient sacrifice. We thank you for willingly him willingly going to that cross to bear the weight of your wrath against our sin. Lord, and he was crucified dead and buried but the grave did not hold him but he is risen alive forevermore father we thank you for your resurrection power we thank you that you have bestowed upon christ the name which is above every name lord may we bow before him and worship him as he is worthy of lord we thank you for what you have accomplished and for revealing this to us we pray this in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Grace and peace, friends. Good to see you all here tonight. You know, some of us men, in fact, 17 men from this congregation are really excited for the coming week. <laughs> That's because 17 of us are headed to the Shepherds Conference down in L.A. And while we are there Tuesday, no, excuse me, Wednesday through Friday, uh, we will hear sermon after sermon after sermon, joy after joy after joy, and it'll be a blessing. I ask that you please pray for us that we uh, truly are equipped at that Shepherds Conference and are built up because uh, any time anytime any member of this body is built up, it's for the rest of the body. So we're going to get built up so we can come back and then build you up with what we've learned. Well, the Shepherds Conference is coming, but tonight we have sort of a mini Shepherds Conference because you're going to hear a sermon followed by another sermon. You're going to hear joy followed by more joy for your own edification. Tonight is the CLI preaching event, night number two. And as I've told you before, the CLI training ended with year three, and this is really the culmination of leadership training. We start men training them in understanding what a godly leader looks like. We talk about character in year one. Year two, we talk about the practices of a leader in terms of the church and discipleship and things like that. And then year three, we focus on studying a particular passage to deliver that passage. And so this, as I said, really is the culmination of the training of CLI. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.2, he told Timothy to find faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Duplication. Duplication is what it was about, and that's what we are here uh, doing as well, duplicating the ministry, raising up faithful men who will teach the Word of God, and then, of course, raise up faithful men as well. Well, the two men you're going to hear from tonight, I would venture to say your children have probably heard from them more than you have. Because these two men have been teaching in GOG, teaching and leading the Adventure Club, DOXA, DOXA Summer Camp, and then some uh, adults have heard them in the HBI and even scripture reading this morning. Uh, we heard uh, one of those brothers read scripture and pray for us tonight. Well, they're going to be preaching from Colossians again, and we're working our way through that book. Of course, we don't have time to hit every single verse, uh, but uh, we will hit a, a number of portions from the book of Colossians. And I'll just remind you that the book of Colossians, we can really summarize as Christ, but we can summarize as the sufficiency and supremacy of Christ. The sufficiency of Christ. That is to say, we need nothing more. Christ is all we need. And we will see that 
in Matt Hertwig as he preaches from Colossians 2, 6 through 10. He'll talk about really the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Colossians 1, 28, he says, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching every man so that they may be complete in Christ. And in Colossians 2, 6 through 10, it describes the fact that we have been made complete in Christ and we need to live that out. And then Craig Murphy will will be preaching from Colossians 3, and we can see that applied to the supremacy of Christ. And because Christ is over all, we submit ourselves to him, and so we repent of our sin. And so our brother Craig will bring us Colossians 3, and will call us to walk away from our sins. Actually, more, more detailed than that, kill our sins and pursue Christ Jesus for his glory. So I'd like to pray for these brothers before they come up, so please allow me to do that. Bow with me. Let's go before the Lord. Oh, Father in heaven, your glory is so precious to us. And as we gather tonight, we are the church. We are your body. We are your temple. We are holy, precious stones being built up up to offer sacrifices of praise to you. And Lord, as we come and we have these brothers whom we love, Lord, we know that they don't preach typically, but this is not practice as it were. This is the real thing. I ask that you would enable Matt and enable Craig to edify us and to sanctify us. Your word is the tool. Your spirit, O God, is the one who will do the work. But I ask that you would use these men. So give them great conviction. Give them great courage. Give them great compassion. Give them a right level of urgency to call us forward to delight in and to see and to treasure the supremacy of you, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then delighting in you is our sufficiency, saying we need no other and we need no more. So please bless them for your name's sake. In Christ's name I ask, amen. Please welcome up Matt Hertwig. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, join you this evening and to bring this text to you. Um, I, I can just tell you that I, I picture myself in this text as Paul writes to the Colossians, and I'm so grateful that the legacy um, of Paul extended on through the ages uh, and touches our lives today in our pastors that train us, that, that build us up, that raise us up, and that train us in I just have to thank our pastors and our elders here and our leaders for doing that as well. Let me begin in a word of prayer, and then we will uh, begin with our text. Uh, Bow with me in prayer. Lord, we magnify you, and we ask and pray that uh, tonight you would be glorified. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that in him we've been made complete. We thank you that uh, we have all that we need. Lord, I ask and pray that you would use me tonight to edify, to encourage, and to exhort my brothers and sisters here tonight, and Lord, to you be the glory. In your name I pray, amen. The beginning of any serious enterprise um, is very important. Beginnings matter. They really do. Um, I have a memory that I'd love to share with you right now um, with my brother. I... I, I love the outdoors, I love climbing, I love mountains. And so um, on two occasions, I, I climbed a certain mountain close to where we grew up. And um, on, the first, on the first attempt, it was right out of high school, and on the first climb, uh, the weather was perfect. It was perfect weather, it was mild. Um, it was early summertime. Uh, we, we started right on time. We were well prepared, had plenty of food, that matters. Uh, we summited safely, and we descended with plenty of time to spare. It was a perfect, it was a perfect climb. It was a beautiful si- uh, scene. And so 10 years pass, and <laughs> we decide, let's do that again. So on the second time, uh, we decided, let's do the same thing. And we know what this looks like. We can replicate this. We'll do it again. And so the second, the second attempt was different, however. It was a different time of year. Um, it was early spring. 
And if you know anything about Canada in early spring, there's still plenty of snow. There was lots of snow, tons of snow, and that made a huge difference. The entire route was covered in snow, and we did not have um, adequate snow equipment to um, summit this peak. And so we made it about 70% of the way up, and we got greatly delayed. And without the specialized snow equipment, um, safety became a real concern, and we decided we had to turn around and head back down the mountain. And really the difference between the first attempt and the second attempt was in the preparation and how we began. How we began made all the difference, having the right equipment. Um, <clears throat> every time I think about that climb, I think um, how we should have began it differently. And it's, it's, it's a good memory to have for exactly that reason, how we should have started differently. Now my question for you is this, how much more vitally important is our beginning in Christ? I want you to consider your beginning in Christ, how you started in him. With what character and attitude did you receive him? It's a beautifully simple answer. If you have the life of Christ in you, your beginning in Christ was with faith. And that's it. That's what you need, faith. In Colossians 1, we read how Paul um, rejoices for how this young church started in the faith. So he, he rejoices in their faith. He says uh, in verse 4, um, We heard of their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for all the saints. But while Paul greatly rejoices in their beginning, his purpose is not to stay there and camp out on how they began. That's not the point of this at all. Um, he doesn't content himself with the sole fact that they began well. And neither should we. Beginning well is not all there is to the Christian walk. Paul appeals to the Lord on their behalf, and he writes this letter not uh, with a desire to see them mature. Um, maturing in faith is where the majority of life happens. If you think about it proportionally, you begin in Christ, and your entire life is spent maturing. That's kind of the big deal in the Christian life is maturing and growing in your holiness and growing in your walk. There's a difference between beginning a race well and persevering to the end. To persevere to the end, maturity in Christ is required. Um, and so let me read for you. Uh, please turn with me in your text to Colossians, in your Bibles, to Colossians 2, verses yeah. 6 to 10. Yeah. And I'll start by reading that. Colossians 2, verses 6 to 10. Maturity in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. <clears throat> And in him you've been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. From Colossians 2, verses 6 to 10, we are charged with three directives in our call to maturity in Christ. Three directives. The first is this, remember the source and root of our faith, verses 6 and 7. The second is to reject counterfeit philosophies traditions, and worldviews, from verse 8. And thirdly, we are charged with the directive to recognize Christ's sufficiency for our completion. Christ is sufficient. And so looking at verse 6 and 7, the first directive in our call to maturity is to remember the source and root of our faith, 6 and 7. And I'll reread that portion of the text for us. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. In this sentence, the bridge is crossed between positional holiness and practical holiness. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. When we received Christ, <clears throat> we were justified, right standing. When we were, when we were received uh, when we received Christ, we were instantaneously in right position with God the Father. And that's extremely important, by faith. This is positional holiness. 
that is not something of degree. That's not something that changes. That is just a mere fact. You either are or you aren't. You are justified, you are not justified, and that's it. But when that fact is established, you can rest secure in your salvation. But having been justified, we are called to be sanctified. That is practicing a right walk before God, which is practical holiness, and that does change by degree. That is something of, that is something that changes, and something that you grow in, and something that you mature in. And we are called to mature in Christ and to grow in our sanctification. In verse 7, Paul gives five reasons why we are to walk in him, and they follow a sequence, a linear sequence. <clears throat> First, we've been firmly rooted in him. The plant imagery, rooted, uh, depicts a tree able to withstand any storm because of the depths of its roots. It's a powerful picture. Um, growing up in Canada, we had vegetation that um, was, had deeper roots because there was constant wind all the time. And something that I found fascinating, I, I, I read this, is that trees adjust to the depth of root according to the weather pat patterns of the area. When I moved to California, we had major winds, and they knocked trees over all the time, and that's because there is not as much wind down here. I found that out. I thought that was fascinating. We are firmly rooted in Christ, and we are able to withstand any storms that come our way because of this rooting. And so we are to walk in holiness because we are firmly rooted in him. The Colossian church received their knowledge of Christ through the faithful gospel proclamation of a man named Epaphras. We read that in verse 6, I want to say, of chapter 1. Um, it's vital to note that their faith was founded upon the accurate teaching of God's word, uh, passed from Paul to Epaphras, and then from Epaphras to themselves. And this is still the means of faithful and accurate teaching. Faithful and accurate teaching is still the means of being firmly rooted in, in our knowledge of Christ. <clears throat> Secondly, we are now being built up in him. Still utilizing the plant imagery. The growth of the plant results from the nourishment it receives from the roots of it. Built up. Being built up follows from being firmly rooted. And if you are firmly rooted in Christ, it'll soon become evident. We just planted grass in our front yard, and... Uh, they say, stay off of it, lots of water with sunlight, and I, asked, I had perfect conditions. And the grass is finally starting to grow, and you can see it being built up. It's firmly rooted, and it's being built up. And I think my boys pulled a tug on it today, and yep, it's down, it's solid. There you go. So if you're firmly rooted in Christ, it'll become evident. And we are built up in order to walk in Christ. That is the point of all of it, to walk in Christ, to walk in good deeds that he prepared for us. Um, Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the point. Thirdly, the next reason we should walk in him is because we've been established in our faith. We've been established. The word in the Greek here translated established has the idea of making something stable or firm, like the thick trunk of a tree. It's made thicker with nourishment and our faith is strengthened through our communion with Christ. We have faith. We're firmly rooted in Christ, we're being built up, and we are established, and our faith is further established. We're growing in degree. Having been firmly rooted, um, our faith is being strengthened and built further. Uh, fourthly, we are to walk in him because we have been instructed by the word. <clears throat> Looking at verse um, 7, just as you were instructed, the phrase, just as you were instructed, modifies the previous three reasons, but it bears so much weight. This is a major branch of the tree. <laughs> it bears so much weight in itself. The lifeline of Christian maturity and growth is the truth of God's word, faithfully taught. When we received it, it was illuminated and applied in our lives by the Holy Spirit, but the conduit through which the word is received is the faithful, um, is the faithful instruction of pastors and teachers. That's how we received it, just as you received it. There is no substitute for the word of God faithfully taught. No substitute at all. And I believe you are here um, at this church because of our pastor's commitment to faithful instruction in the word. Let your walk correspond 
through the word of truth you received. Finally, we are to walk in him because we are overflowing with gratitude. Our Christian walk should be characterized by our overflow of gratitude. And I, I sense that every time we gather here for music, for the, for the worship, and for the singing together, and I, I feel such joy, and I know you do as well, and it's really the overflow of our gratitude to the Lord. We should be the most grateful and joyful humans on the planet. We should be filled with joy continually. We should be like Zacchaeus, who responded in his overflowing gratitude with overflowing generosity. The one overflowed from the other. Christ was infinitely generous towards us, which should fill us with infinite gratitude, and we should pour out likewise, pour right through us. If you desire to walk in him, you must engage your will and your mind and your affections and your gratitude. Our second directive toward maturity in Christ we find in verse 8, and it is to reject counterfeit philosophies, deceptive ideas, and worldviews. Paul here exhorts the Colossians and us with urgency. He says in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Evil actions are the spawn of evil ideas. Think about that with me. How well do you recognize satanic ideas and concepts? And more importantly, or equally important, I should say, when you recognize them, what do you do with them? Do you continue to engage or do you reject them on, on contact? The battle for your soul begins as a battle for your thoughts. It starts with your thoughts. It starts with your thinking. Every one of the evils listed in verse 8 targets the mind. There are no um, activities in verse 8. It talks about philosophies, worldviews. It talks about ideas and power that target the mind. Um, and they all share a common source, and it's satanic, a, sa a common satanic source. And so listen to these words with me. Hopefully you all recognize them and whose they are. Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? It's not at all accidental that the first question recorded in Scripture contains the first seed of doubt and defiance and the first instance of the world's philosophy about the nature of God. There's philosophy for you right there, Satan's question, and that's precisely what Paul's guarding against here. The age-old battle for the mind is why Paul writes this negative command here. And friends, we must train our minds and bodies in righteousness so that we recognize Satan's subtle suggestions and repudiate them utterly. As spoken this morning by Pastor Steve Schneider, here is right thinking, Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, there's anything excellent, and if anything worthy of praise, let your minds dwell on these things. That's the, that is the tool that you have to battle it. Um, when, when I taught junior high uh, years ago, I spent a great deal of time on this because they are bombarded with ideas through the music that they listen to, through the things that they watch. We are too. We're no exception. And we need to guard our hearts and minds. And the, the guard for it is to turn our thoughts and our minds to Christ and continually behold his goodness. Uh, here, then, is another question to consider. Why is philosophy, rhetoric, and argumentation of men so captivating? Why is it that this has our attention and, and tempts us so greatly? And here's the answer to it. it. It's because man's intellect is a part of what it means to be made in the image of God. It's a glorious and grand thing. That's the height of humanity. It's the height of what it means to be man. It's, it's how we have dominion over all the earth. And so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. But at the fall, this intellect was utterly corrupted. And it, in fact, was turned now towards evil. And that is what we see here with the philosophy. Know thyself was an ancient Greek saying that celebrated this uniqueness. And it actually is a good saying. That's not inaccurate. As Christians, we agree with this statement. It's important. But we recognize that we can only know ourselves truly in the light of knowing God and knowing his son. That is the difference. 
Know Christ and you'll know yourself. The great temptation presented by pursuing philosophy is self-exalting pride. It really is the seat of power. Knowing God dashes pride to pieces. The moment you see Christ and you know who he is and you behold his glory through faith, what room is there left for pride? There's none. The very glory of God was the bait presented to Eve in the bite of that fruit in the garden. Tempted with elevating to the height of God. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And so it shouldn't surprise us that uh, Paul spends a large amount of time counter-arguing the evil ideas presented by antichrist philosophers and thinkers. Um, maturity in mind is recognizing the wisdom that there is in following Christ. And that is given to you through faith. Through faith, your mind is being conformed to the image of Christ, but that still takes discipline. That still takes maturing. That still takes your walk. And the sword with which Paul fights is the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this sword, and this is the sword with which you and I must fight as well. Growing in knowledge of Christ is the key for you and to me and me to maturing in Christ, not growing in vain philosophy or human tradition. Are you disciplined with your intellect and with your thought life and with um, sources that you let in? That's my question for you. We need to form godly habits. This leads, me to our, this leads us to our third and final directive. Our final directive from this text is to grow in maturity. To grow in maturity is to recognize Christ's sufficiency for our completion. This is the high point of the text. Um, and this is where the death stroke happens to the world system. Verse 9 and 10 say this, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. The full glory of the Father is reflected in the face of the Son. Endless sermons could be preached about this, this statement here, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Fullness of deity? Our minds are not built to wrap around that concept. That is, that is the height of heights, and that is what is in Christ. Only those who saw Jesus with eyes of faith saw his, divinity, his divine nature, saw his divinity. Through faith, they recognize that he is divine. All others could only see his bodily form. So they saw Jesus. Some saw that he was the Son of God and others didn't, and that's through faith. The glory of God, which Satan usurped to tempt Adam and Eve, is the rightful glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan said, here, Eve, you can hand it, you can have it, when really it belongs to Christ all along. Friends, Christ is sufficient in every respect for our complete sanctification. It's like Andy said this morning, now that it's, <laughs> this is taking us way beyond our natural resources, and praise God for that. We are not made complete in ourselves. We're not made complete in philosophy. We're not made complete by our efforts. We're not even made complete in, in our disciplines. We're made complete in Jesus Christ. Made complete could also be translated made full. It's a verb, uh, it's, a, it's a perfect verb with pass, it's a passive participle. And that, the fact that it's a perfect verb, um, we had explained this morning, it means that when we were made complete, that was a past action that has continuous and future results. It's powerful. We are made complete, that's a fact. And that actually gives us the victory in our maturing as well. The fact that we are made complete means that we will reach glory and it will be completed perfectly. And you can guarantee that. The battle is already won. If his sacrifice is sufficient to appease the wrath of God on your behalf, well then he is sufficient for all other things as well. He is sufficient to bring you to glory. If the wrath of God is appeased by what Christ did on the cross, he is sufficient for you and I. And we end this text where Matthew ends his gospel with the all-encompassing authority of Christ. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
So what room is left for worldly philosophy or earthly kingdoms when we consider the awesome glory of our risen Lord and Savior? He is Lord. He is the authority in heaven and on earth. The best news in the world is that the Lord of glory already came to earth and has paid the price so that through faith we can be made complete in him. Maturity in Christ calls us to draw to him in a pure knowledge, recognizing who he truly is. Jesus is the fullness of deity in bodily form. And the height and the breadth and the wonder of this reality may only be received by faith because it can never be comprehended by philosophy or reason or any other means. Paul's own meeting with the Lord Jesus permanently changed him, and that was his message to the world. And now my question for you is, have you truly met the Lord Jesus Christ, and has your life changed as a result? I'm going to end with the uh, reference to Pilgrim's Progress. If you remember the allegorical story, Pilgrim's Progress, the central character, Christian, and his neighbor, Pliable, both did an excellent thing by leaving the city of destruction and beginning on the path to the celestial city. But their beginnings were very different and their endings were very different. At the first sign of difficulty, Pliable abandoned the way, and Christian alone continued on, and eventually entered through the gates of the holy city. Christian persevered. Beginning well and persevering in faith are both essential, but to persevere to the end, maturity in faith is required. Let's pray. Lord, we draw near to you, and we desire... Lord, to grow in our maturity. We desire to grow in holiness and sanctification. We thank you that you have um, justified us, Lord, that you have um, paid the penalty for our sins. And Lord, we desire to grow near to you. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that help me to grow near to you. And Lord, I thank you for the sweet fellowship and communion that we have here. Lord, may we grow in our love for one another and, and grow in holiness, Lord, and protect one another and guard each other. And Lord, I I thank you for our leaders here at this church, and I just ask and pray that we would together grow in holiness and grow toward you. We exalt you and we give you our praise and our thanks. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Good evening, Hickman Community Church. Proverbs 26.11 says, Like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. In light of this proverb, the great theologian Charles Spurgeon posed the following question to Christians regarding sin. Oh, do not be so mad so foolish. Did sin ever yield you any real pleasure? Did you find solid satisfaction in it? But inasmuch as sin did never give you what it promised to give, but deluded you with lies, be not a second time ensnared by the old fowler. Be free and let the remembrance of your ancient bondage forbid you to enter that net again. Like many of Paul's epistles, the book of Colossians begins with doctrinal instructions followed by practical exhortations. Miguel, Arthur, and Matt have shown us doctrinal instructions in chapters 1 and 2. Now, in chapter 3, Paul gives us the practical exhortation and outlines what Christian conduct should look like. Tonight, we will consider Colossians 3, 5 through 11, where Paul exhorts the believer to put on the new self. But before we get there, let's take a look at Colossians 3, 1 and the word, therefore. Colossians 3, 1 says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. In other words, Paul is saying, if you're adhering to the doctrine that's laid out in chapters 1 and 2, that means that you have been raised with Christ, and you seek the things of Christ. The next, therefore, that I'd like to consider 
is found at the beginning of our text in verse 5, where Paul says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. The second therefore points us back to 3.1. And we can rephrase 3.5 to read, If you've been raised with Christ, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. In light of our text of Colossians 3, 5 through 11, I want us to look at two types of sins you need to kill if you've been raised with Christ. Turn with me to Colossians 3, verses 5 through 11. Therefore, Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to open your word and come before you. I ask that you give me clarity of mind and that the words that come out of my mouth would be precise. Let me be a herald of your word proclaiming truth and free from error. As we study your word tonight, I ask that we would examine our lives to determine if there are any sins, be it private or public, that we need to put to death. I ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae to exhort those who've been raised with Christ to kill sin in their life. He touches on two types of sins, and these are not meant to be exhaustive lists. But the two groups listed in verses 5 and 8 and 9 can be grouped as private sins and public sins. Let me explain what I mean. Private sins live in your thought life. They need to be rooted out before they turn into lifestyle sins that characterize and dominate your life. The short list of examples that Paul gives in verses 5 are immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. Let's take a closer look at some of the sins that Paul lists, starting with immorality. In 1 Thessalonians 4.3, Paul tells us what the will of God is, to abstain from sexual immorality. It is God's will that we are set apart from sin to holiness. The battle against immorality begins in the mind. This is where we need to begin to put to death this sin before it manifests itself into a lifestyle sin. Next, Paul moves on to the sin of impurity. Impurity is not simply the sexual act, but it is the evil thoughts and intentions that lead up to the act. Jesus gave a clear message on this topic in Matthew 9, 28, when speaking on adultery. Anyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He goes on to say that if your eye is causing you to stumble, to pluck it out, for it's better for one of your members to perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Paul next calls out passion and evil desires, which are closely related to one another. Evil desire begins in the mind, which leads to passion, which, if allowed unchecked, 
manifests in a sexual act outside of marriage. In James 1.15, we see that when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. This is quite the warning against lust, which is synonymous with passion and evil desire. Do not give lust a foothold, for it brings forth death. Instead, put to death passion and evil desire. The last private sin that Paul mentions is greed or covetousness, which in a way is a root of all the other sins. Greed is to want more, but it is not limited just to money. This sin can be found in the Ten Commandments, both in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. One who is greedy or covetous is not content with what God has graciously given him. They are not content, but they always want just a little bit more. One of my favorite books is C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which we've recently read together as a family. A great illustration of how damning wanting more of the wrong thing is can be seen in the first encounter between Edmund and the White Witch. Edmund was hungry, and the witch offered to give Edmund whatever food he wanted best. He asked for Turkish delight. It was the best dessert that he ever had. With every bite, he became more enticed by it, but he could not be satisfied by it. When the witch's supply of Turkish delight was depleted, he could think of nothing else but how he was going to get more of it. He went so far as to lie to his brother and his sisters and tried to lure them to the witch, putting them all in danger. Sin, like Turkish delight, cannot satisfy. If you indulge yourself in it, it will lead you to great peril and your life may be required. Paul says in Philippians 4.11, Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. Paul learned contentment, which is the opposite of wanting more. If you are content in who you are in Christ, you will not be greedy or foster evil desires or passions or impurity or immoral thoughts. Let us all be content in our position and pleasures that we have in Christ and not seek to satisfy ourselves with our worldly thought life. From the personal sins that Paul tells us to put to death in Colossians 3.5, he moves on to list out six public sins we are to kill, listed in verses 8 and 9. The first group of sins were mostly manifested against ourselves or within ourselves. The second list is sins that we commit against other people, and they include anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, and lies. As with the first list, this is not an exhaustive list, but merely examples of types of public sins we are to kill. The first public sin that Paul addresses is anger. James 1, 19 through 20 says that we should be slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. James goes on to say that we are to put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and receive the word which is able to save your soul. We are to be doers of the word. The implanted word is what will save our souls. The second public sin that Paul addresses is wrath. Wrath typically is seen hand in hand with anger as it is usually what follows unchecked anger. Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.31 that we are to put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. Why? <clears throat> because the previous verse tells us that it grieves the Holy Spirit. 
Instead, we are admonished in verse 32 to be kind to one another. Next, Paul admonishes the Colossians to put to death malice. Malice is a vicious nature which is bent on doing harm to others. In 1 Peter 2.1, Paul exhorts believers to put aside all malice. He explains in the text that a Christian cannot grow in their new life unless their sins are renounced. For the word of God to do its work, the believer must purge their life of these types of sins. The fourth public sin that Paul speaks of is slander. Slander is oftentimes the end product of anger plus wrath plus malice, and in a real sense is blaspheming man. The Greek word for slander is derived from blasphemia. When referring to God, it is translated as blasphemy, but in relation to man, it is translated as slander. In Matthew 5.22, Jesus warns that anyone who calls their brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. Jesus did not take lightly slandering anyone. Man is made in God's image, and slandering someone is ultimately an affront to God. The next public sin that Paul speaks of is abusive speech, which can include obscene or derogatory speech. In Matthew 12, 33 through 37, Jesus taught on the power of words and how one's words reveal their character. Just as a tree's fruit reveal its character, so a man's words reveal his character. Every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. What a sobering reminder that every word we utter is weighed by God. Let us be thoughtful of what we say to one another and put to death any abusive speech from our mouth. The last public sin that Paul addresses is lying. In John 8, 44, Jesus speaks of the nature of Satan. Satan does not stand for the truth. There is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of lies. A son will manifest his father's characteristics. When we live in the truth and are characterized by it, we emulate the father. And by contrast, those who lie are characteristic of Satan. Who do you want to emulate? Benedict Arnold may be one of the most infamous traitors in history. Once a major general for the Americans in the Revolutionary War, Arnold led many successful military campaigns. However, in 1780, he conspired with the British to hand over West Point to them. The plot was discovered, and Arnold was nearly captured by the Americans. In his subsequent service to the British, Arnold led multiple attacks on the colonies, where he burned cities to the ground and killed thousands of Americans. No wonder he is regarded as one of the worst traitors in history. If not put to death, these sins will act as a traitor to betray you. Not only will they betray you to yourself, but in turn, they will cause you to betray the body of Christ. If we are partakers in the risen life and complete in Christ, we must kill sin. In Romans 8.23, Paul paints the picture of us groaning in our sin, waiting for the redemption of our body. As long as we live in our earthly bodies, we can be tempted. Let us all, as we still live in our earthly flesh, kill sin as we eagerly await the redemption of our bodies. If you've been raised with Christ, how can you have victory over sin? Private sins, such as immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, to name a few, begin in your thought life. There's to be no room for that if you are a Christian. 
These sins need to be uprooted lest they begin to grow like a weed unchecked in your life. When these private sins flourish, they can be manifest in public sins, such as anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, and lying, to name a few. These sins are aimed at others. Paul explains why we are not to engage in this behavior in verses 6 through 10 of our text. God's wrath is coming for these things in which we once lived. And since we have put off the old man, put on the new man, as each day we are to become more like Christ in our sanctification. Don't be like the dog who returned to his vomit or snared a second time by the old fowler. Let us put on the new self and be free from the grip of sin, for we have been raised with Christ. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time in your word. For those of us here who have been raised with Christ, I ask that we would have victory over sin. I ask that you convict us of the private and public sins that we have in our lives and that we would uproot them before they betray us. May we all remember that sin cannot satisfy and that the only resting in our position in Christ can we truly be content. Strengthen us as we put on the new man and seek to become more like Christ every day. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. May we indeed be satisfied in Christ, not looking to the things of this world or the flesh to fulfill us, but striving towards maturity in him. May he be our all in all. Let us stand together and sing that song we know well. You are my all in all.
Well, if there's one thing that we've learned today, it's that Jesus Christ changes everything. We heard it this morning, he's the key to contentment. And we heard it tonight again, that every aspect of our life, who we are, how we live, what our present and future and eternal destiny uh, involves is all changed by Christ and knowing him. And again tonight, I would just say, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, then I appeal to you as Jesus himself appealed, come. Don't leave it too late. Come to Christ. Give your life to him. Follow him and know the blessings and the transformation that was mentioned tonight uh, from the text. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Craig. Uh, great job, you guys. And uh, just good to be in the Word, isn't it, tonight? and having that unpacked for us. Let me pray for us and dismiss us. Father, thank you for this day. Oh, what a day it's been, Lord, a day of fellowship, fellowship with you, our God, as we've sat around your word, as we've heard it explained and expounded to us. Father, fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ as we've engaged in each other's lives as we've heard of the things that we're challenged by and the difficulties that we face and the joys that we've experienced, Father. All of these things are truly a blessing to us. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you that, Father, people can come and and in one time being here can walk away and and, and say in their hearts, this is truly a church that honors and glorifies God. Thank you, Father, for, uh, for this, uh, this reminder that, Lord, even when the world is in chaos, Christ is seated on the throne at the right hand of the Father on high. And, Lord, we pause tonight to pray for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Father, we just ask, protect them, give them courage, make them resourceful, Lord, make them Even in the midst of their lack and their fear, Father, make them look to you. May they grow in their faith through this time of of threat and of of horror, separation. Lord, so many things are enduring. We just pray, God, that in all of this, you would be near to them. And like the psalmist, they would would understand that the nearness, nearness of their God is their good. Father, if you so allow that their lives be taken, we pray, Lord God, they would enter into your presence rejoicing with great joy that they have not denied the faith, but that they have persevered even to the end. Lord, for those of us, as Andrew mentioned at the beginning of the service, who are going down to Shepherd's Conference this week, we ask that you would stir our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, that you would cause us to think on those things that would be beneficial not only to our own lives, but to the ministries that you have us a part of, the lives that we disciple and the families that we care for. Father, bless your word to our hearts and to the men who gather there. We ask you to prepare even the speakers uh, for this time, that, Lord, their messages would be appropriate, that they would be powerful, they would be spirit-empowered, Lord, in a way that touches our lives and changes us. For those who can't come that would love to come, Father, give them the joy of being able to listen at home, to catch up that way. We just pray, make that time a special time for this church, for the men that are heading down there. We pray your blessing on everyone else's life this week as we go about our daily lives. Guide us, watch over us, prosper us. Uh, Encourage our words to be honoring to you. Uh, Stir us to evangelize others. Lord, cause us to be encouragers and not discouragers. Motivate us, Lord God, to please you this week, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You are dismissed.